The second lecture this morning is uh, David Braff. And uh, David is a dear friend, so I'm sorry I'm biased, but I think that his, his work is wonderful. And so is his mind, which is really very interesting to follow. <laughs> that he's, he's a distinguished professor of psychiatry. He was the uh, director of the schizophrenia program at UCSD. He was the director of the multi-site consortium on uh, the, uh, the genetics of alcoholism, and he leads one of the premier clinical genetics some, uh, co uh, groups uh, that are working together, uh, it, but this one focusing on schizophrenia. Again, a superb clinician who for years ran our only major inpatient psychiatric Board that's before the VA, or, and then of course the VA was opened as well. But uh, he ran that unit for o over a decade, and he'll help remind us of how long. Uh, but uh, he's a, a wonderful man, and I am happy to introduce him. His topic will be endophenotypes and schizophrenia, illuminating the genotype to phenotype gap, something we are many of us uh, trying to do for other disorders as well. So, David. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, um, so uh, I have my replaceable Casio stopwatch. So I, uh, Eric Granholm, whose work um, uh, in schizophrenia and cognition and, uh, and digital um, uh, therapies is v very important, you'll hear from him, uh, said you'll never do this talk in 15 minutes. Well, I, I did it 12 times. It took 14 minutes and 32 seconds. And with my trusty $20 Casio watch and stopwatch and the red light coming up, I'll just stop, and you'll be glad when, <laughs> when I... Uh, I have no conflicts of interest. All my conflicts are with uh, first-degree family members. Um, I'm really talking about the Consortium of Genetics of Schizophrenia, uh, case control st family study and case control study. Of those 5,000 subjects, I mean, COGS-1, you have to get a proband, an unaffected uh, sibling, and both parents to come in for two days of testing. Now, that means you don't have exactly typical patients, but they were pretty, pretty uh, uh, impaired patients. Uh, I'm going to give about half of my talk. Well, I think I have a slide that illustrates this. Uh, yeah, I feel like Leonard Cohen had this line uh, in his concert in London, which he said he hadn't played in Royal Albert Hall in 15 years. Uh, back then, he was a 60-year-old kid uh, chasing a crazy dream. Uh, I kind of feel the same way in trying to chase down the causes and treatment of schizophrenia. This is a brief outline, very brief. So I'm going to give you about half of this on context for neuropsychiatric and schizophrenia research. I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole. Uh, of, of some of the specifics. And I think Mark Geyer did a, a terrific job uh, on the, the PPI side of things, the pre-post inhibition. So this is, I'm going to stick more on the left, the Monet, not on the right. No one wants to have their throat slashed in a biblical uh, tale. That's a Car Caravaggio that was found uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago in someone's attic worth $150 million. So I guess the person is now retired. Uh, in terms of I, I, I can't give a talk without, like this without talking. My career was modulated in a really good way by Tim Beck and Arnie Lazarus, the founders of cognitive behavior therapy, where I thought I was going. And then when I, at Penn and Yale, then I left Yale's residency after one year and came to UC San Francisco and had the incredible great fortune of working with Notch Calloway. Um, he was, he had an incredible, talking about minds, he had an incredible mind. And actually, I ended up here partly because he said that Arnie Mandel was down here and that uh, uh, the department was growing and that there were rumors that the, uh, that the psychiatry department would have a uh, La Jolla-based yacht, much like the uh, Stanford yacht. But I think those, I don't know where those rumors came from, but David Siegel and uh, Sam Barandas quickly disabused me of that idea. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, this is just five of the eight and nine sites, uh, uh, smiling people. I, I put this first so that I, I don't leave them out, but you don't know their names yet, so I'm, it's a paradox. Uh, face recognition test. So 
Go to the ACNP, and Sir Martin Ross says, researchers are like Columbus. When he left the Iberian Peninsula, he didn't know where he was going. When he got there, he didn't know where he was. He did it all on someone else's money. <laughs> and uh, the money's harder to come by now. But I think that's, and, and, and incidentally, we, in schizophrenia and neuropsychiatric research, I discussed this with Sam. There was an article uh, uh, in Nature on, on the 108 loci associated with schizophrenia that only accounted at probably $400 million for 6% of the variants. So I was going to write a, a, an invited article about the NIMH genetics program. So I've looked and looked, and I found the greatest quote from Sam Barandes. It was, this is the first step in a journey of 1,000 miles. <laughs> and I think what he was saying in a nice way is, we'll probably, and, and John Kelso, who's smiling, uh, we discussed this too, that we may be looked on like people who were using leeches in, in 60 years. Um, we are very early in, in our uh, uh, discovery. And this, this kind of shows that, um, I wrote this for Joe Coyle, and I put uh, uh, breast cancer, small cell lung cancer in stage two, one of that beginning moderate application. We're still in the middle of discovery in neuropsychiatric research. And we're far from bending the curve on, uh, on, uh, on outcomes. Uh, I, I'd written a paper, and David Goldman, who's a friend, wrote, wrote this great thing. It's a kind of a kid's thing, a phrase. Are we almost there yet? And that you can see his text. No, we're not almost there yet. But, and as Mark said, uh, we're building a foundation. I think Mark illustrated this very well. Uh, of our students and their students in schizophrenia research and many other domains to advance. Here's a simple example. This little girl has cleft lip, cleft palate. The surgeons go down there, uh, set up a field hospital. This is a terrible condition because of the psychosocial implications in, in, in Mexico. Her life is totally transformed. What about the faces of schizophrenia? Whoops. What about the face of schizophrenia? Incredibly more complicated. This young woman talked about the fragmentation of her consciousness, yin-yang, and got into all sorts of paranoid stuff. You, you know, schizophrenia bulletin puts uh, patients' arts uh, on the uh, cover. So th this is Mark's slide. I don't, I'm not going to re reintroduce it. Other than the fragmentation, the cognitive, ever since the time of Bloiler, the, the, I see as the core, don't forget, Hallucinations and delusions are seen as accessory symptoms. The core symptoms really involve neurocognitive collapse. And that's why people like Eric, who's on this panel, and Greg Light, using mismatch and, and targeted uh, uh, training, sensory training, are trying to reverse that without knowing the genetic basis. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to have a, a gene in order to have a treatment. Uh, of the three billion base pairs, um, uh, um, this is just stuff you already know. Of the three billion bases, what can what, just one do? Well, if you have a highly penetrant mutation, it can do a lot. This is from the cover of uh, a Science. <laughs> I love this because I'm a dog person, and I bore people with stories about my dog, who I, I say is she's my favorite mammal. Um, there are a lot of nice people in, in this department, but she's still my favorite mammal. <laughs> Shh, don't tell family members. Uh, so, 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 so insulin growth factor, a single uh, change out c can really affect, not in this species, uh, a dog size. So this was the cover of schizophrenia uh, 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 bulletin. But we're dealing with much more complex disorders like schizophrenia, where gene by environment interactions is also uh, a key. So we can get a lot of information. We have a lot of knowledge. We don't have enough integrative wisdom, and that's going to take a lot of computational advances in terms of looking at gene networks, which I'll show you in a minute. So Francis Collins said, the, uh, Francis, what Francis Collins said um, is that family history is the strongest of all currently measurable factors for many common conditions. So for the clinicians in the audience, you have a tool that sometimes we don't in, in, in the pure clinical science world. Well, we do actually. In our studies, we try to get family histories. But you can see the families in, in great detail, and that's a very important uh, uh, aspect of things. Here we go again with COGS. Now I'm going to discuss the COGS. Irv Gottesman, who is transcendently smart, <laughs> pure smart, uh, uh, introduced the concept of endophenotypes. I think 
the Cogs actually kind of stole, I didn't, I didn't consciously do it, COGA, which is uh, Mark Shuckett's Consortium on Genetics of Alcoholism. So I just changed the last letter. Um, <laughs> uh, this is on the path of genes to fiends, neurocognitive and neurophysiological uh, intermediate expressions. The advantage here is that they're quantitative. Because these are quantitative measures, not binary fuzzy diagnoses, you can apply statistics. And in gene finding, uh, 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 Naomi Ray and Lee and, and Blangero, ha major figures in statistical genetics, has show, have shown that you have ten to up to 10 times the power to detect genes for end phenotypes. As Mark said, that gives you domains and domains that you, you can aim at rather than the disorder itself. And that's what we do uh, with the Consortium on Genetics of Schizophrenia. So endophenotypes are therefore, uh, uh, they're closer to genes than our diagnoses. They're neural circuits, uh, uh, um, they're closer to neural circuits. And as you'll see in the next talk, uh, Neil Swerdlow and Mark and I were lucky enough to have Neil up here from uh, George Koob's lab. Uh, which was, uh, along with uh, starting th these projects with Mark, was very transformative for me because they all knew so much more than I did about neural circuitry and, and, and the basic science basis that we were looking at. So uh, the clinical, f it's also closer to the clinical features. Also, th these neurocognitive and, neuro and like PPI, neurophysiological and uh, imaging disorders, are, are um, they're very, very, um, e if you have the time, uh, you can measure them. And Matrix and the FDA has endorsed some of these neurocognitive uh, uh, markers, deficits, for new treatments, which is, I think, an advance. Rather than talking about, quote, treatment of schizophrenia, they're talking about treatment of underlying neurocognition or reversal of deficits. And the deficits Michael Green has artfully shown at UCLA, who's in the COGS and also our MIREC, has shown the, the close relationship between neurocognition and function, and neurocognitive deficits and poor function. So these, this is the power and efficiency of quantitative neurophenotypes. So and the phenotypes, as Danny Weinberger, uh, a friend of mine, said, is <laughs> the title of an article, the use of endophenotypes is a no-brainer. That could be taken two ways, <laughs> but I, I'm going to take <laughs> I'll take it in the good way. Uh, um, Maybe not. I never thought of that until just now. I have to <laughs> give him a call. At 11 minutes, here's the COGS and the phenotypes. So I, I really was trying mostly to paint this big, broad Monet picture for you. We have all these and the phenotypes. Inhibition, these are the domains. Salience, inhibition, vigilance, attention control, working memory, learning, uh, the cognitive battery f uh, from our colleagues, COGS colleagues, Ru uh, Ruben and Raquel Gore, or as non-misogynists would say, Raquel and Ruben Gore, uh, and many uh, domains including social cognition. And we have many secondary and the phenotypes. Um, Greg Light has done a very artful job of looking at mismatch negativity, which along with prepulse inhibition is probably a predominant biomarker for uh, schizophrenia. Uh, and it's a difference detector uh, uh, for, for outside stimuli. Um, he actually has, and I mentioned this to Arnold, uh, uh, recently me playing a minor role, there's a PNAS paper on chaos-based nonlinear analyses of some of these domains. And so he's worked with mismatch negativity, targeted cognitive training, increased, increased cognition, and better outcomes with chronic patients, which people didn't think could be done uh, at alpine convalescent. So we, we have a lot of endophenotypes. So first thing is, d did our patients, I'm not going into all the Ns and p-values, did our patients all have deficits? Yes. The patients had deficits on all of these measures that I just told you about. In the broad sense, are they all heritable? Well, we had family studies, so we could do a look at de novo mutations and did a sequencing study with Mary Claire King, who found the breast cancer gene, and we identified a prenatal, prefrontal uh, uh, um, uh, uh, target uh, that, was that, that, that these endophenotype-laden uh, pa patients uh, had. Um, so the, 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 the heritabilities are all lower 
than the heritability of schizophrenia, which is commonly thought to be 80.80, but I think Irv Gottesman has knocked it down to 0.65 and to 0.80. But that's because these domains add chunks of heritable deficits. And if you have, and they may be orthogonal, but they may be independent. So if you have enough of these chunks, tips you over into neurocognitive dysfunction and schizophrenia. We don't know the answer to that. We're doing some papers to examine it. So here on the, um, on the y-axis, we have genes. On the x-axis, we have uh, the endophenotypes. Here, if you notice, what stands out is that norregulin and ERBB4 have a tremendous number of hits. They're highly pleiotropic. What they have in common is they are genetic substrates for uh, synaptogenesis and, and expression of glutamate. Supporting the, uh, this supports the glutamate hypothesis of schizophrenia because we have glutamate dysfunction and then we have, and this is a kind of summary, and then we have um, uh, the uh, associated with these problems. So Tiffany Greenwood uh, created this uh, gene network. The implication of the gene network is going beyond singular genes. It's possible that a gene out here, an SP4, could have a minor association with schizophrenia, but imbalance this entire, I, I hope I'm expressing this correctly, imbalance this entire huge network with many of the functions that it has. So this is one of the really trenchant problems we have in neuropsychiatric genetics, trying to understand this. <laughs> actually, Will Carpenter, once I was talking too much, actually, uh, uh, is a great guy, he pulled me off the stage. That was embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> he actually did that. <laughs> Mark says he won't pull me off the stage, but I don't believe him. Um, the next thing we did is COGS-2. Um, I'll just, okay, COX-2 showed, COX-2 basically showed that in a case control context, we could, and other people have replicated this finding, um, we have whole genome-wide hits, 10 to the minus 8th, I'll just give you an example, HCN1, which has a lot to do, it does a lot of things, but one of the things it does, it creates, it has rhythm, and has rhythm in the brain, and has rhythm in the heart. And of course, rhythm, uh, beta, uh, gamma frequencies, theta frequencies are impaired in schizophrenia. So that's interesting. It does a lot of other specific things. So we have uh, whole genome-wide hits now. Uh, huh. The future. It's the best time to be a student. And the reason it's the best time is because, 16 minutes, the, the best time is because we know some stuff, we have a foundation, and we don't know, what we don't know is a tremendous amount about how what we have will translate into better treatments and bend the curve on the outcome of schizophrenia patients. Um, we do have, uh, I mentioned some drug and behavioral uh, new, new tools in our toolkit. So thanks to the, uh, these are the, obviously uh, market covered, we've done a lot of translational other research. This is just limited to, to COGS, uh, and these people have all been key, uh, in, key collaborators outside looking at things like machine learning, um, um, and the phenotype rank, and cognition and aging from our huge data set. And that's it. I, well, I thank people. Oh, the, uh, the only thing I wanted to mention, uh, stop the applause. Oh, no, no, no. Does that mean I have to leave? <laughs> oh, you're so kind. The God of Janus is the God of beginnings. We have to be careful about what we know and look forward. And that's why he has two faces. So uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. So again, fantastic session. I'm learning a lot uh, that uh, we had uh, someone more from the basic science approach to uh, schizophrenia, uh, showing uh, the translation from animals to humans and humans to animals, then a part of a very large schizophrenic consortium where you can begin to identify genes related to components that are associated with the disorder schizophrenia and start to look uh, similar to the graph or a table, that, uh, more of a graph that was shown, as to what genes are related to which of the subcharacteristics or endophenotypes uh, and start to step your way forward regarding which combinations might contribute to schizophrenia.